When did the 60s folk revival really begin? In the most important ways, it was a December night in 1949, when four unlikely stars debuted at a New York nightclub, the Village Vanguard. They called themselves the Weavers, and they changed everything. So many of the songs that defined the 60s era, If I Had a Hammer, House of the Rising Sun, This Land is Your Land, Midnight Special, Guantanamera, even Kumbaya, were popularized a decade earlier by the Weavers. Their powerful unison approach became the model for folk groups like the Kingston Trio and the Clancy Brothers. In England, they inspired a fad called Skiffle. The Quarrymen began as a Skiffle band before going electric and changing their name to the Beatles. Pete Seeger, Lee Hayes, Fred Hellerman, and Ronnie Gilbert were part of the leftist folk scene, mostly performing informally at hootenannies and labor rallies. One day Lee Hayes said, what if we, you know, rehearsed? Pete got them the nightclub gig, which lasted over six months. DECA music director Gordon Jenkins heard them and set up an audition. After one song, label head Dave Cap asked the question that still plagues folk musicians, do you want to be good or do you want to be commercial? Both shouted Lee Hayes and Cap walked out of the room. So Jenkins put his own name to their first single as if the Weavers were guest vocalists with his orchestra. It shot to number one, Deck assigned them, and for the next two years, the Weavers were the most popular music group in the world. Friends, if you've been dancing to this song the last year, you'd like to know maybe that it came to us from the new land of Israel. We're singing now not only those new English words that we made up for that record with Gordon Jenkins, but also the original Hebrew words of this song that was written for lots of people to sing and dance together. <laughs> The public could not get enough of their exuberant sound. Pete's voice was soaring, Fred smooth and soothing. Lee's earthy bass seemed always to have a twinkle in its eye. And then there was Ronnie Gilbert. In an age of dainty singers like Doris Day, her fierce and joyful alto inspired a new generation. Nearly all the strong female singers who led the 60s revival, Joan Baez, Judy Collins, Odetta, Mary Travers of Peter, Paul and Mary, claimed Ronnie as a primary influence. The Weavers decided to see how far they could take this. Could folk songs exist in the pop mainstream? They largely avoided their political repertoire and allowed Jenkins to slick up their arrangements. Oh, let the midnight special shine a light on me. The Weavers wrestled with the most basic questions about how to perform folk music commercially. For example, what to wear. Pop singers then dressed formally or in elaborate costumes. That didn't feel right for folk music. They decided, as Ronnie put it, to dress nicely but the same way we would off stage. This groundbreaking informality became the model for how folk musicians would present themselves on stage. But something else was happening. A grubby magazine called Red Channels listed the Weavers as suspected communists. Clubs stopped hiring them, radio stopped playing them, a proposed TV series was canceled. DECA fired them and removed their records from its catalog. By 1953, they were singing at a dive outside Cleveland called Daffy's Bar and Grill, and they knew it was over. Lee said, if it wasn't for the honor, 
I'd just as soon not have been blacklisted. But what they did after that was even more important. Pete converted the Weaver's formula into a grassroots solo career that helped ignite the 60s revival. In 1955, their manager, Harold Leventhal, approached Carnegie Hall about a Weaver's reunion. They said yes, if he put up the money. On December 24th, the Weavers performed their most important concert. So many tickets were sold that chairs had to be set up on stage, and prominent New Yorkers, tired of the blacklist, walked defiantly past FBI agents taking down names. Decca wouldn't record the concert, but a tiny classical company that liked folk music would. Vanguard Records soon became the leading folk label of the era. I'm gonna keep right on a traveling on the road to freedom, gonna keep right on a traveling on the road to freedom, gonna keep right on a traveling on the road to freedom, gonna keep right on a traveling on the road. The way Pete and the Weavers reinvented their careers taught folk a powerful lesson. We're better off doing it ourselves. Leave it to the commercial cats, and sooner or later you'll end up at Daffy's. Do it yourself, and you're at Carnegie Hall. They worked as an occasional group after that. Pete left in 1957, replaced by Eric Darling and then Frank Hamilton. But from what they sang to what they wore, the honesty of their approach to the resilience of their spirits, the Weavers taught us how to be professional folk singers, and why folk belonged in the modern musical arena. They taught us we could do this ourselves, fueled only by the muscle and will of those who loved this music. So what Carl Sandburg wrote way back then is true today. Everywhere folk music is heard. When I hear America singing, the weavers are there. Mm -hmm.